Go to InvestorThrive.com right now to check out some of our free training on how you can make money as a real estate investor or schedule a time with me so we can chat about our mastermind mentorship and how we can help you learn how to wholesale nationwide and grow your business. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing great today. Thanks for having me on. Oh, anytime. So Investor Thrive Nation, we got a podcast. I got Rob Hanson. I got a good treat for you guys. He's been investing since the 80s, right, Rob? Yes. Yeah, a long time. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, I'm probably the only real estate investor you might ever meet that um, was forced into real estate investing. Right. I didn't want to I, I had no uh, desire to be a real estate investor. Really? And my dad. Yeah. My dad was a real estate agent. And, you know, back then you couldn't just be a real estate agent because there wasn't enough money. There was no national MLS or you couldn't find properties online. There was none of that. Right? right. And so each real estate agent controlled their own little neighborhood, three blocks, four blocks. And my dad was also an appraiser. So he comes to me one day. I had, I had just uh, gotten out of culinary school. Right. And I was working as a chef in Atlantic oh. city. And uh, he comes to me and he's like, listen, like, I think back then I was making about 17 or 18,000 a year. Like it was not a lot. Right. It was, a, you know, so uh, he comes to me, he's like, listen, I have this property you can buy for like 15,000. You can put like 10,000 into it. You can sell for like 60,000. You have to buy it. Right. So I'm like, begrudgingly, I bought it. And he's and, and I didn't know the construction end of it. You know, so he was like, I have the guys for that. You know, when we get to that point. So I buy the property a couple of days later. My dad has a heart attack and dies in his early fifties. Right. So, uh, you know, so now like I'm in this house, I don't know what to do. And, you know, uh, the sharks come out, right. All these people came out and they were like, Oh yeah, I'm friends with your dad. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to do this job for you. So instead of making a lot of money, I made a little bit of money because a bunch of people took advantage of me. I didn't know what I was doing. And, and uh, but I made like half a year salary when I should have made like a year and a half salary. Wow. So I was, I was still like pretty excited about it. But I was, you know, I was like, oh, man, like, you know, where do I go from here? Like, what do I do? You know, so I, I lost my safety net and I, and I lost my mentor, my guide all the yeah. same time, and my dad. So That's rough. Yeah. It must have been a tough time. Huh? I'm sorry to hear about that. Yeah, it must must have been rough. It was rough, but you know what? Like I look back on it and like I had to, you, you know, I had to figure things out. Like, and as a young guy, you know, like I was in my early, very early twenties, like I didn't have much life experience and, and, you know, mindset was like something that really jumped out at me. I, and I started to look at people, right. And maybe you've done this too, is you go, well, like I have, I'm smarter than that guy. I work harder than that guy. And that guy's got 10 times what I have. And like, I don't know how he does it, you know, and that done it, been there, done that. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why I went down the path to figure out like what holds people back and, and, and why, you know, and, and um, we talked a little bit earlier and, and right now, you know, uh, change is happening, you know, and yeah. change in, in, in change, you know, this change will be good for real estate investing. It will be good for deals. There'll be, you know, a lot more deals out there. So, you know, don't be afraid of this changing market would be my advice right now. You know, I've been through a lot of cycles, like in the late seventies, early eighties, interest rates were like 18, 19%. It was crazy. Yeah. I want to ask you about that. So when they were that high, w did they not have that much of an impact on people buying because I, I wasn't there, but I was just curious, like the, the houses probably were at 30, 60, hundred thousand. So the payments, even at 18% probably weren't that high, but that might be relative because I mean, it might've been a lot back then. Yeah, it was, but here was the thing. And most, most, most people don't understand this about that time. Most homes were sold by way of FHA financing then. Right. And mm -hmm. because most of the buyers were people coming from out of world war, uh, out of World War II, right? So there, there was a lot of blue collar workers and, and lower paid white, white collar workers, right? right. So m most of the money that was being lent was FHA financing. So instead of the sign saying for sale, the sign, the sign would say, uh, you know, FHA financing, which all those loans were assumable. And so like if, if the house was worth 30,000 and they owed 15,000 on it was FHA and it was at 5%, you could assume that 5% loan and then you'd take the difference in 
the higher rate. So the blended rate wasn't as high as 18. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, but, and that's the other thing, like interest rates, even though they're going to go up here, they're never going, they're not going to stay up for long periods of time because think about where the money is. Right. And this is something that investors really need to understand is banks make money on lending. Right. And so when interest rates stay high or stay low for a long time, right. They, they need these periods of refinance. Right. Yes. So like we might have two or three years of six, seven, whatever, but then they're going to drop back down because the bank's going to refinance. They're going to make money. And, you know, that's how it goes. So so it all like things change. They can change rapidly. Um, you know, yeah, opinion. I actually have a friend uh, of mine that's uh, he owns a, a refinancing mortgage company. And he basically when the rates go up, he can't he doesn't have, um, you know, well, no, is it when the rates go down? I think that's when the rates go down. He he can refinance a lot of people out, but when they go out, he he basically goes into real estate investing. He's like, now he like shifts his whole company, he starts knocking doors, you know, having his team call, and then he gets properties. And then when the rates go down, then he he can refinance people out. So I think I know exactly what you're saying. It's just, you know, it sounds like they they need that, right? For yeah. for his business, for the banks, for everything. It's the cycle of opportunity, right? Like he's he's the prime example of it because he's he's he doesn't really need to do real estate investing when the market's hot like we've had for the last couple of years, you know. Um, and now when the if the market shifts, I mean, like I think that you know we could have a replay of like two thousand eight, which you know two thousand eight was was a scary year for me only because like. Um, you know, it was like doom and gloom was predicted till like 2014, right? And then the Obama administration put in this first time home buyer credit, which just turned things around relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And interest rates then were like six and a half. So, I mean, that's true. Yeah, I, didn't, I was in high school in 2008. So I don't even really remember that. If it didn't really affect me because I didn't have a job at that time. Yeah. Well, I then, did, uh, but I was at Smoothie King, but that's not real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I love Smoothie King, by the oh, way. Same here. Where are you but, from, by the way? Where, where do you I, live? I'm in uh, southern New Jersey near Philadelphia. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Georgia, so, you know. Yeah, so, I have friends in Atlanta, a bun bunch of real, real estate agents and people in real estate companies and stuff like that. So Awesome. Nice spot. So um, I kind of want to go back, if it's okay, to oh. when you went oh, – you said your dad – he. he when he was a real estate agent, um, there was no MLS at the time. So he, you almost had to cultivate your neighborhood. Like the people knew who you were. And uh, when you got into real estate, uh, did you start do, using that strategy as well? Of like, Hey, cultivating your area and having people know who you are. Like what was, did, did you go into like being an agent right after your first flip? So, um, no, I didn't right away. Actually, I had to get my real estate license at 18 so I could stay in the house and uh, not pay rent. Right. Mm -hmm. And but I never really. Yeah. Yeah. I never really used it. Um, mm -hmm. And there was an MLS, but it was books. Right. Like it mm -hmm. was like you got these books like every every other week. And there was a trick in real estate. Like, so you had to submit all your listings by Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday here. And so you held off your listings till Wednesday. And then you had like two weeks to sell your own listings. And oh, so it was like, you know, kind of the way some people do it now, you know, they, they do coming soon or whatever. Um, so I, so like, I think that there's like, there, there's a natural progression in real estate, right? Like in real estate investing, you start off kind of wholesaling. And, and if you want to get in, wholesaling is the way to go. Wholesaling is hard work, right? Like, it's and so, so like I, right now I use all my own money. I don't use bank money, right? And most of the return, I, I'm like, okay, so this may sound weird, but I consider myself a real estate investing in investing lion right and i don't mean i'm the king of the jungle i yeah. mean like a lion eats like once every three to five or seven days right mm -hmm. so like i'm to this point where i don't have to do a lot of deals every week five deals ten deals whatever mm -hmm. and like i just bought a property about 10 days ago uh the return on investment is going to be 40 percent net right after everything and and like that's all that i i buy anymore because like and i leverage the real estate community i i have a real estate license now i leverage the real estate community i let them uh 
they they represent me on the buy, they represent me on the sell. I pay, I do pay the commissions there, and I get a lot more deals than I ever got pounding the pavement on my own. Not because you're leveraging the community, you're leveraging agents and other things like that. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Because think of it, even in this time, like right now, you talk to a lot of real estate agents, they're struggling, right? Yeah. So if they if they got an estate deal or they got a they, they got a deal that that was really a tough underwater deal, they're going to call me before it ever hits the market. And I'm going to get under contract on it, you know, and uh, before hopefully before it ever hits the market. And when you pay them, is that do you negotiate the commission or is it just like, hey, I'll give you three percent. You bring me a deal. How I give that? them three percent. And then when I sell, I give them three percent. I figure like, you know like we're in a two and a half percent. We've been in a two and a half percent market lately, but like 3% to somebody who like a lot of real estate agents, even the best ones, their, their numbers are down because there's just not inventory right now, which, you know, so. Yeah, I agree. So, so I'm curious when you make that call to that agent, you, let's say you call someone brand new, but you, you, you obviously are the line. I, you can get it done. You're not just wholesaling these properties and just hoping to find a buyer. You, you want it. Right. So how does that conversation go for you when you're like, calling someone that's new that maybe a lot of agents probably are distrusting where they're like, I don't know if this, if this is worth my time to talk. So how do you do it? So basically like, I don't call them, they call me. Right. Oh, so, really? Yeah. So like I'll meet somebody some way or another. Right. Like, and I'm in real estate. So I know a lot of the agents in my market. Right. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'll just say to them, Hey, listen, like I'm a buyer. If you ever have a, a deal that I can flip and I can make money, you represent me on the buy and then you can represent me on the sell and maybe you can double side it on that end. Right. And if you're a struggling real estate agent and you need a commission and you want to double side something, maybe you're, you're going to give me a call and give me first shot because I'll close with it as soon as I can get title done, you know, which yeah. is usually like 10 days. Depends. When you say double side, you mean, um, like uh, where they represent you in, in the transaction. So they get the 3% as the listing agent and as the buyer's commission, they yes, get 6%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and so they double, they, uh, what did you call it? I, 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 we call it double dipping. What do you call it? Yeah. Double siding. Double yeah. Siding. Double siding, yeah. So they could technically, you know, double side on, on bringing you the deal. Right. And then they could also double side on listing it and also maybe even having a buyer at the end, maybe. Right. So that's right. Because like they are going to be with me on the project and they're smart enough to stay in touch with me as I'm going along. And they're like, hey, I, you know, they'll, they'll post something out on like social media saying, hey, I'm going to have this property coming up in this neighborhood. DM me or your IM me and and uh, let's, you know, and then and then I'm like, yeah, bring them through like, you know, so. Oh. So for someone like me that, you know, I've done, I've done a couple flips, mainly it's been wholesaling, but like when I call real estate agents to network, most of the time I'm pretty good on the phone. So I feel like they, they, I, they're like, okay, this is a seasoned investor. He knows what he's talking about. But most of the time you can tell that they're a little skeptical. Like, am I dealing with someone that, uh, you know, I can trust that I can bring a deal and actually get it done. Do you, do you, you don't really face that anymore. Right. Cause you've, you've had those relationships. Yeah. I don't face that too much because I'm in the real estate community, right? I'm like, I'm well known, like as a, as a real, you know, as, as being in real estate, you know, I serve on the local association of realtor board. Right. So a lot of people do, do, right. What's that? That must help too, serving on the board and, and, you know, getting well known. Yeah. Get involved, like get involved, get to know people because it's all relationships, right? It's all, you know, like, you know, so somebody needs a deal and somebody's talking like agents talk about everything. So, you know, one agent, might say, hey, I got this property. I want to try to double side it myself or double dip it myself. Right. Like and then they'll say, well, call this guy. He's you know, he might buy. You know what I mean? And and that, you know, there's no competition like you see it in your business. Like, you know, there's no nobody's my competition. Like I, I'm to the point where like I'll buy anything, but I like to buy them. I don't like to buy the lowest property values because I'm competing with more people right. and I don't like to buy the highest property values because um, sometimes you can sit on those. I like to buy like the middle of the road sweet spot. And in my market, that's three to 400,000, right? Yeah. That's kind of the same with, well, in, in Salt Lake city, Utah, like the low end is like three to three to four now. And then, you know, middle is probably like four to seven. And then, then they got high end, but yeah. no, I know what you mean, you know, and plus, um, you know, we've seen, 
with the higher end, it's it, it, when the interest rates increase, those prices start to drop way faster than, you know, de price decreases than the lower end stuff. Those, those maintain their value a little bit strong, stronger, I feel yeah. like, but more competition, like you said. Right. Plus like, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a trick. There's a lot of agents out there that are like REO agents, real estate owned agents, you know, they're representing banks and those guys like, you know, those guys, know the properties they're going to get way in advance, right? Because to a certain level, they, they help the bank property manage, you know, secure the property, whatever. And then they have, the, usually they have their first person who's going to really compensate them on the side or make them a partner off the books, right? And, uh, but, you know, they're, they're, but every, like, even me, I can't buy everything, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to Say that again. You wholesale a lot. Like if an agent brings you something, you're like, this isn't for me, but I, you know, maybe, you know, someone in your network that would want it. I, I, I usually don't take a fee on that. I usually just say, call this guy like that, that might, you know what I mean? Like I'm to the point where like a couple thousand bucks isn't, isn't like worth my effort. I hate yeah. to say it that way because it's a couple thousand bucks. Well, well also I'm sure it, what goes around comes around like you by just giving back, like, and just, you know, not taking a fee might. They might remember you, you know, be like, hey, he's, he's sending me deals. I can't take on this one right now. Let me call him. Well, you know, it's a lot like what you do, Nate. Like, you know, like you, you have free training for people out there who want to get started. Right. And like you don't charge anything for that. And I, and I really applaud you for that, because like when I started, it was like it was like secretive, you know, like there was like nobody was talking to anybody else. Like, right. like everybody was like lack, lack and limitation, no abundance. Today, it's like, listen, you're going to help that guy. He's not your, he, he's not your competition. He might be in, he might be in Florida, right? And, you know, if you can help him learn, you know, it always comes back to you in one way or another. And th that's been a game changer for me. And we can talk about mindset because you said you do have two certifications, right? Um, yes. One thing that changed my, my business and me is when I stopped looking at uh, this business as comp others as competition and having a more abundance mentality versus scarcity mentality. Cause when I first started, you know, I was going on appointments myself, I was going to sellers and I, you know, I'd hear, Oh, I'm talking to five other investors and I would be like, Oh man, you know, this is really tough. I got to compete. But then I realized, you know, like there's more than enough deals to go around. And if I'm helpful, that's why I created the Facebook group. Cause you know, a lot of people don't know where to go to get information. And I'm like, yeah. if I can help people out, it's just going to be better for me too. I mean, everyone wins. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about your, your mindset training. I've, uh, I, I love Franklin Covey, uh, training. We've, we bought, you know, a very expensive course on sales from him, you know, mm -hmm. and it's been great, but yeah, let me, tell me a little bit about that. So when, you know, after my dad passed away, right. Like, and, and I saw people who I had, I thought I had better skill set then. Right. And they were, much more successful than me, then I was like, all right, well, what's holding me back? Like, why is it? And like, to me, like, if you, you, you start with, okay, well, you know, backing into it, your actions, what you do create your results, right? Well, what creates your actions are your feelings and what create your feelings are your thoughts, right? So it boils down to your thoughts. And then I like all this stuff, like I did the, um, positive mental attitude training from the Napoleon Hill foundation who wrote the book, think and grow rich, like in the thirties. And, um, interestingly, he didn't profit off that book, uh, at all, but, right. um, yeah, he, he went through a divorce and then his, his, uh, ex-wife got made all the money off the book. I'm sorry. I th I'm sorry. I said, Franklin Covey, you, you got it. You're the Napoleon Hill. That's yeah. right. Okay. And, yes. And I'm familiar with Franklin Covey, Stephen Covey, like, yeah. you know, I've read all his stuff, but, um, but so, so to what it boils down to in, in my head is, is that if you, if your, your mind works like this, you, you're born and you, you have some pre-wiring, you know, from your DNA, but most of what you learn is, is, is all learned behavior, right. And learn, and learn thinking. If you look at a kid, you, you know, you go, if you walked into any, like, kindergarten class and you asked who here is a really good singer right that every kid's going to raise his hand you go into eighth grade and you ask them who's a really good singer here like maybe the one kid who's the really good singer right, right? so it's all learned stuff right and then what happens in your mind is, is your mind gets programmed and and um 
Anthony Robbins says it like this. Imagine like it's a vinyl record, right? Like, and you take, uh, you know, something and you scratch up the vinyl record. It's never the same. It's kind of, that's exactly what the way the mind works is. The way the mind works is, is like the mind always reverts back to what's familiar, right? It's your mind, it's born to protect you, right? It, it, and so whatever you, instructions you've given it, it will, fulfill those. So the only way to change that is to make what's familiar, unfamiliar and something new familiar. And that just takes repetition and, you know, and, and, you know, attention to it. Yeah, no, I, I love, I'm all about mindset. I'm all about uh, consistency and daily activities, daily actions that will reprogram your brain, you know, like journaling, gratitude, you know, uh, affirmations, things that really like change, I guess the, the programming that's in your, your mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's hugely important. Um, and the one thing is, is like, you know, you're very receptive at certain times, right? Like that time, you know, like if you've ever been driving and like, you know, and all of a sudden you're like home or wherever and, you know, someplace you go, you don't even really remember, you know, like you're sort of like in a, in a hypnotic trance, you know, right. so you're much more receptive to new ideas and to change your, your, your thoughts during those times, which are like right before you go to sleep, right before you wake up or through meditation or through self-hypnosis or whatever. So, right. yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to tell you this, uh, not a, like a confession, but just to let you know something that's been difficult for me and my business, whether it's investor drive or my wholesale business is like, um, Taking action, you say your action is basically what gets you results and then thoughts, right? But the thing that I found difficult in my life is as I gain more knowledge, I want to do more things. And I feel like I'm being more effective because I, I, I'm smarter or I know more things. So I try to do more. And um, I found that that's been like detrimental or been difficult to, to grow in my business because, you know, when I first started investing, I did like a couple things and I did them really well and I did them like – consistently yeah. but now it's like oh well you know i can talk to agents i can get deals i can also do an email like a text blast right so there's just so many things so what would you what advice would you give me or anyone watching where it's like where with all this knowledge is abundant like how is it how can you focus on things that will get the job done like get, get you that's great i tell mike i have little kids right like i have a nine eight and five i have my first kid at 51, right? So I, I tell my kids, we can do anything. We can't do everything, right? So, and, and to you, I would say change lanes slowly, right? Keep mm -hmm. doing what you're doing because that's where your revenue is coming from. And then just, you know, like spend a little bit of your time. Like I'm very big on planning, right? Like a, a planning out my day, planning out my week, you know, and, and, and like, you know, you, you have to be flexible in this business. So like I block time, but that time block can move around, right? Like, and, and if I have to shift things around, that's just part of life, right? Like the more flexible you can be, the better off you're going, going to be. So mm -hmm. change lane slowly. And then just like, you know, like, so, I would say four days a week, focus on your main thing. And then one day a week, have fun, right? Do branch out into those other things and, and, and see where, you know, see where that takes you, you know? Yeah. Cause what I found from talking to you from uh, our limited conversation is just, you know, you focus on, you know, working with agents and that's kind of like what you do, right? Like you, you bring, they bring you deals and you're like, Hey, I don't really need, I'm a lion. You know, like you, you know what you need to do. It's not like it's, it sounds like you kind of have, locked in like i guess your your activities or what you what you're looking for pretty much yeah i mean pretty much i do the same thing every day you know and discipline discipline will set you free right like it really it's like you know if you i i try to teach my kids like routine like do the same things like do it like to that it becomes second nature and that you don't have to think about it and you know you just like and if your thoughts, like if you're a cold caller or whatever, like, and, and your thoughts are, oh man, like I'm just going to get rejected or whatever, just change your thoughts to say, hey, listen, like I'm going to make 25 calls and I'm going to get 24 no's today. And I'm good with that. Right. Yeah. Like, because you know, what happens is, is like, as soon as you hit that one, you get all excited and you're like, I'm, I'm ready to make a thousand more calls. Right. Yeah. But yeah. when you get to call 50 and you're like, oh man, this sucks. You know, if it does that, like, 
I always take a break. Like I'll, I'll run to the gym in the middle of the day or I'll like go for a walk or I'll get a coffee or whatever it is. Right. Just take Good a break. Advice. Like don't keep banging your head against the wall. Just stop, you know, and, and, you know, but you, you like, you know, everybody's got to know th their limitations, you know, and like mm -hmm. being older, like you figure out your limitations, you know, it's, you know, right. Well, I mean, honestly, it's been really insightful and helpful. Um, I, I, I guess we can wrap up, but I want to ask you what, um, what's one thing you'd like to leave the, the viewers of Investor Thrive, which are mainly new wholesalers, new investors, what, what would you like to leave them with? Just keep going, you know, just, just keep learning and don't be afraid, you know, just, you know, the one thing I would say, if you're new and you're wholesaling, throw something out there that says, Hey, uh, I, I'm going to have a, a great wholesale deal coming up. Like any investors out there, hit me up, build your list. Right. Mm -hmm. And then call them, have a conversation. Hey, what do you like? Like, I, you know, and then get your core group and you're going to change. You're going to change. You're like, you're going to change. You're going to do a deal with a guy who's going to be a total jerk. You're like, I'm never working with that guy again. Move on. Right. Just, right. you know, keep, keep, keep moving on. Keep doing your thing. You know, that's great advice. So it's like, you know, have, that's an actionable uh, thing that we can have them do. If anyone watching this or will watch this, go out, make a post on a Facebook group or, uh, you know, any, anywhere where you have, I guess you can get reach, reach out to investors and say, Hey, I'm going to have a great deal coming soon. Uh, put your emails below or send me your information. I'll reach out to you and kind of give you some details, build that core group that you have and, and, and kind of find out what they want and almost reverse engineer what they want and you'll find it. Yeah. And if you are a real estate agent or whatever, you can do research on that person. Like, you know, like, like you'll see what properties they've done, like, and you know, whatever, like you can search them and then call the agent and say, you know, Hey, what's this guy like? Like, you know, thinking about working with them, you know, and they'll yeah. tell you right away. You'll get to know who the good ones are and the bad ones are. Sometimes it'll be painful and sometimes it won't be, but you know, it's, it's part of the process. For sure. Well, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with? Uh, tell how anyone can reach you if they want to, you know, have a deal in New Jersey or anything. Yeah. I'll just give you my phone number. Like you could send me a text and we could jump on a call. It's 609 area code 440-8557. Um, you know, and listen, Nate's given great value. Like, listen, I, I love the, the, the guys that are like doing it and then sharing it. And like, and I really appreciate you're doing that because me growing up, I didn't have that, you know, I didn't have that, you know, I only had sharks in the water. I didn't have friends. Yeah, that's, uh, that's unfortunate that it happened to you. And you know, what's honest, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty transparent with everyone. Like in our business, because things have changed a little bit in the market, we had ac our acquisition reps were virtual assistants that were good. I mean, they're expatriates, they're good, they're Americans, but now with things is changing a little bit, like um, and buyers being a little bit more hesitant to buy, at least where, where, where we're at, like I'm hopping back into acquisitions of my company just to kind of help out again and actually hop on calls and talk to sellers. So like, that's, that's just, you got to pivot. And sometimes you, you don't want to, you know, go back into certain parts of your business and fix things, but that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm really in there with people. Like I know what you guys are facing, like, cause I'm yeah. sellers like that. And one last thing, like I, I never buy a property that I don't have a fallback on, which is like, okay. So if, I, if I can't sell it, like the market shifts, sometimes that happens, right? Mm -hmm. If the market shifts, like I, I need to be able to rent it out and I need to be able to make money off of it. So, mm -hmm. and like, I'll take my own money and then I'll refinance out of it. So I have my money to do another deal. So crunch those numbers, see what your fallback is. Yes. Always have like an exit fallback strategy. Very, very important. Very important to like, if you, if I can't wholesale this thing, am I willing to take it down? Do I have a way to, yeah. you know, to, to buy it, like you said, burr out of it, do, do whatever I need. So awesome. Because usually like, usually I have more than 20% into the property. So when I refinance out, I take all my money out, which right? is, yeah, you yeah. don't want to leave it in there if you don't have to. Right. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. Cool. Well, Rob, I appreciate it. I think this has been awesome. Um, uh, it's, it's been great. And I think we should definitely hop on another one in the future and you just whatever you want. Yeah. Thank you. All yeah, right. You have a good one. All right. You too. All right. Talk to you later. Bye, Nate.